Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a series of the most popular nuclear-related shorts on YouTube. I'm going to talk about how accurate they are. This should be good. This first short about an underwater nuclear test. In 1946, the U.S. military set off a nuke underwater to see what would happen. This actually happened. Um, note that nobody was on these ships at the time, and this was a test, but they really performed this kind of crazy underwater test. And it went very badly. You it see, did. The Navy was trying to prove that their ships could survive a nuclear explosion, so they lowered... Uh, I'm not really sure it was more on that line. I think it was more on the... Could, how powerful are nuclear weapons and what effect would they have on ships rather than hey our ships can withstand a nuclear blast the bomb 90 feet in the water and put their ships over it the that's right it was only 90 feet underwater lsm-60 was right above the bomb and it was completely pulverized other ships vaporized actually not just pulverized they couldn't find anything left of this vessel now this weapon was on the order of about 20 kilotons, so a bit bigger than Hiroshima. Sank right away, and the extreme radiation destroyed any remaining ships. So other ships did sink right away, at, but I don't, I got a problem about the radiation destroying remaining ships. So what made this so deadly was the hydraulic pressures that it generated from being underwater. Normally one of the most destructive aspects of nuclear weapons was the air overpressure, the blast wave, the shock wave. But air doesn't do nearly as much damage as water. So that underwater shock wave sunk many ships. Now, saying radiation destroyed many ships, that isn't accurate. Um, it didn't destroy ships. What it did do was it contaminated several of the ships so badly that they actually had to scrap them. Um, they were planning on salvaging some of the materials of these uh, target ships, but they actually had to scrap these entirely because the dose rate was so bad for the uh, scrappers that were attempting to decon and then scrap wrap the individual parts of the ships. However, nine of the ships were able to be deconned and scrapped safely, so any remaining ships isn't, isn't an accurate statement. But this test produced such a large radiological hazard because the effects of it were so close to the surface. This isn't a bad short. It says it went bad, but it doesn't really tell why, um, since they were planning on ship destruction, but the contamination was what made it so bad, and you could argue that in 1946, this was the first real nuclear disaster that, that ever occurred. Oh, by the way, if you're liking this video, please join me in my journey to a clean nuclear energy future by liking, subscribing, and commenting. This next video is called What a Nuclear Reactor Actually Sounds Like. This is what a nuclear reactor actually sounds like. <laughs> now that's a uh, very small reactor we're talking about. Similar to a research reactor that my operations crew did at Texas A&M University. This isn't that. It sounded like they were speaking a different language. Um, that one had a capacity of just one megawatt, and yes, you could actually stand above it with a camera while starting it up. Um, the water will protect you from radiation, and there's not that much heat with just one megawatt, so that 30 feet of water is plenty to uh, keep you safe. Note that large reactors um, such as the 3852 megawatt reactor where I worked at, you could not stand directly above at power. That one is kept safely in a reactor pressure vessel located inside of a reactor containment building. I'm not a big fan of why he put spooky music over this. It kind of diminishes the really cool effect of the actual sound. The mechanical yeah. clunking noise you hear is the sound of the control rods being removed out of the... 
Yeah, dude, cut that sound out. <laughs> it gets in the way of the cool control rod noise. Control rod's job is to basically cock block a nuclear reaction. These sit in between the fuel rods and block neutral. I don't know how I'd phrase it, but yeah. Um, those control rods, um, the little operation they did which turned it on is can be known as a pulse. They actually rapidly ejected control rods. Think of it as rapidly accelerating in a car. Um, you never want to do this in a full-sized um, nuclear reactor, just a small little test reactor. Uh, me and my crew even called that one a toy. Um, but yeah, that's what control rods do. They prevent fissions from occurring by absorbing neutrons. ...from colliding with uranium atoms. In turn, this ensures a nuclear reaction doesn't take place until someone hits the big red button. <laughs> yeah. Um, so nuclear reactions are all about statistics, and it is much more likely for a neutron to be absorbed by control rods than um, fission nuclear fuel such as uh, uranium. Now where I work, the big red buttons and switches actually shut down the reactor. They do the exact opposite of what they did in this video. Um, all the control rods fall in rapidly and safely shut down the reactor. The blue flash, also known as Sherenkov radiation, is basically a mega fuck ton of energy <laughs> being released all at once. It's actually got nothing to do with energy. Um, it is what happens when you go faster than light in water. You can't go faster than light in a vacuum, but light slows down to about 75% of its speed in water, and the particles traveling at this speed, so maybe mega F ton of speed being used, not, but not, not energy. <laughs> <laughs> it glows blue because the particles are moving through the water faster than light typically travels. Okay, so he did he did go on to explain that. Cool. It's essentially the light version of breaking the fucking sound barrier. Mm -hmm. I saw a fake video of one of these things starting up on my For You page, so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, that was not a bad explanation when he talked about that, um, but he said normal speed. I just want to clarify, it's faster than going light in water specifically. Um, you can't go faster than light in... In a, in a vacuum. I, at least we haven't figured that one out yet. But speaking of sounds, there's another popular video called What a Nuclear Bomb Sounds Like. I think by the same guy. This is what a nuclear bomb actually sounds like. That low-pitched humming noise you heard was the electromagnetic pulse interfering with the microphone. The more- Yeah, and... It travels at the speed of light, so it would be immediately after that thing goes off. Before you even saw the uh, mushroom cloud showed up, then that effect is immediate, because you're only a few miles away. It doesn't take light long to go that far at all. Think about it, the more terrifying it becomes. On a scale of one... Again, he needs to get the spooky music out of this, because it's about sound. Let's just listen to the original sound by itself. Then I give it a number two, because it definitely made me shit my pants. <laughs> Seven miles and over 30 seconds later, the shockwave reaches the camera. You'll hear what you'd expect. And that is such a beautiful illustration of the speed difference between light and sound. It takes sound a little bit of time to travel that many miles away. A loud bang, followed by something absolutely bone chilling. It's funny. That deep rumbling you hear is the sound of the fucking earth being sucked into the mushroom cloud. In fact, <laughs> that's a very dramatic way of describing um, wind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it creates, um, you know, the pressure builds up, it funnels in, um, the explosive force radiates upward into the sky and just takes a bunch of dirt, like you said, and a lot. That's a, this isn't a bad explanation. One thing I want to point out is this has nothing to do with the nuclear aspect. Any high yield explosion, you take a few thousand tons of dynamite and do that, then yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get a similar result. 12 million shit tons of soil is lifted <laughs> off the ground, leaving a 300 foot deep crater in its wake. By the way, this one's just a baby. It's 16 kilotons, which is around 24% smaller than the bomb dropped on August. So yeah, that, that's a, that sounds about right, 16 kilotons of typical uh, te nuclear test from that time period. It looks like from the 40s or 50s. So this chart right here that he shows up, uh, um, I've seen this before, 
Something to keep in mind is most nuclear weapons are on the order of 300 to 400 kilotons. You probably can't see it too well, but if you watch the original video, which I'll have linked in the description, the B-83 uh, bomb of 1.2 megatons has been deployed at scale, but the SAR bomber and even the, the theoretical SAR bomber, um, there's only one of those, and weapons of that size are quite impractical. I actually made a short on that myself describing how impractical it is. And there's only one of them. So don't think there's hundreds of 50 megaton super nukes laying around somewhere. This next video talks about the stages of a nuclear bomb. Let's check it out. When a nuclear bomb is detonated, there are five stages where its effects are seen. Stage one, so he's going to talk about the effects being seen, but let's go to stage zero. Let's go before that. So conventional explosives push a critical mass of material to induce nuclear fission. This fission reaction rapidly multiplies, and then the explosion occurs with all of that, all of that energy stored up in that device. This happens in less than a microsecond. There is actually a unit of measured for this called a shake. A shake is 100 nanoseconds. That's how fast this reaction is. In thermonuclear weapons or nuclear fusion weapons, the heat and pressure from the nuclear fission bomb causes a fusion reaction in the second stage of the bomb, creating an even more powerful weapon in a similarly short time frame. Flash of light so bright that people living as far as 50 miles or 80 kilometers will be temporarily blinded. Stage two, a heat wave traveling at the speed of light for 15 kilometers or eight Okay, he needs to specify the yield on this weapon. Um, rough estimate of a thermal pulse about that big. Um, we're suggesting maybe 400 to 500 kilotons, so that's that's typical. That's, that's not a bad number. Six, eight miles will burn anything in its path. Stage three, nuclear radiation spill. Stage four. Nuclear radiation spill? I mean, yes, uh, lots of radiation is released. This is a big nuclear reaction after all. I don't know if spill would be the word I use for that. That implies like, oh, you just spilled something on the floor. This is, this is way more violent than that. A fireball will appear, the core of which is hotter than the surface of the sun, along with the- Okay, um, he's getting steps in a bit of a different order. Um, so the 100 million degrees Celsius, um, that is the area where the fusion occurred. The entire fireball, which for a 400 to 500 kiloton bomb would be between 0.7 to 1 kilometers, give or take, that whole bit is in 100 million degrees Celsius. It rapidly cools off as you get away from the ep epicenter. But yes, fusion does make things that hot. If the entire fireball got that hot, man, it would cause even more destruction than <laughs> what you would uh, typically get. And stages one through four happen at about the same time, though the fireball technically comes first. Um, you would perceive it as about the same time, but light still has to go from point A to point B. So it would start at the center with the uh, fireball, which would include radiation and the thermal pulse, all of that traveling at the speed of light. Yes. A large mushroom cloud made from the remains of the fireball, dust, and ashes rises miles in the sky, casting a dark shadow everywhere. While stages 1 through 4 happen within a matter of seconds, stage 5, which is the radioactive fallout, could last a few minutes or hours. This is the most dangerous stage. During this stage, tiny radioactive particles will fall from the sky, leading to radiation poisoning, resulting in adverse long and short-term health effects on survivors. For more informative videos, Okay, um, how is the radiation fallout more dangerous? These so-called stages one through four is immediate death. <laughs> you can't be more dangerous than that. And he even talked about this, like, okay, you know, bad short-term and long-term effects. Sure, radiation poisoning is horrific. One of the most horrific ways to go, but... He is not accurate at all in saying it would ever be more dangerous. The only situation where the fallout kills more people than the blast would, and the fireball would be if you set off the nuke in a remote area and a densely populated urban area happened to be downwind of the explosion. But that would never happen in a real attack. You would attack the concentrated area.
Now, he left out the blast wave, though, which is actually the most devastating aspect of the of the uh, of the weapon. Because um, while th third degree burns are ho are, are horrible. That doesn't necessarily um, cause all the deaths. The overpressure, we're talking stripping flesh, rending bones, all kinds of horrible, horrible things that are happening. Um, not within as large of a radius. It depends on the weapon, probably on the order of a couple of kilometers for guaranteed deaths and 12 kilometers out for um, severe injuries, so which will likely result in death because the whole area around will, would be destroyed. So these people wouldn't necessarily be able to get medical attention very much. So, yeah, the blast wave—that's that's what's going to kill people. And he and he left that out. That's that's no good. All right, now for one last one. I think I think this one's pretty silly. Do I even need to explain this one at all? Hmm. <laughs> you would need many, many tons of M&Ms between you and an explosion to protect you. <laughs> this is great product placement. I don't know if it got sponsored by M&Ms or not, but that's that's wonderful. But hey, thank you very much for watching. Um, let me know what you saw to some of these shorts. Uh, these were... Uh, these were pretty silly, I thought, but um, there were a couple that I actually thought did a did better than what I thought, since what's popular is not necessarily um, what's accurate. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.